the book is structured because the hardest thing to do was to balance out the art, the architecture, and the memorials. Because I was pretty much told by the time I got to grad school, you gotta make a choice. <laughs> you can do architecture or you can do art, but you will not be allowed to do both. I don't know. I don't think I ever chose to do both. I think I was just wired that I wouldn't give either side of my brain up. Um, if you talk to my English professors in high school, they thought I was going to go into English. If you talk to my math teacher, they thought I was going to go into math. If you talk to my, I was a nerd, but I also was my father's daughter, and I was making art my entire childhood, probably every day. So you get back into 10,000 hours. I probably put it 15,000 hours. There wasn't a minute where I wasn't in my room or all over the house making something. Um, my dad's a ceramicist. I'm going to end with some thoughts about my dad. This is one of my artworks. So the artwork is in five, three sections. The architecture and design is in two sections. And it took me the longest time because there's one part of those five chapters that I couldn't figure out what to do. And it's the gardens. Because it was bad enough that I was doing art and I was doing architecture and I had these memorials. But the minute you throw in landscape architecture, it's, oh my god, what is she doing? And I realized what was the breakthrough in the book was the art has an indoor and outdoor component, as does the architecture. And so I make the volume, which is the building, and I also make the gardens outside. But it's tapping into the functional purpose of a garden. A garden is almost built for other people. An architectural work is built for other people. Art, I get to go into my head and do whatever I like. And what kind of bothers me is that there's an assumption that art is easier because you can do whatever you want to do. How many of you are artists in the room? Come on, I want to show of hands. I would say that when you have an infinite number of choices, it's actually much harder. It's almost easier to problem solve. And that's at left side, right side. Was it easier to get A's in math? Absolutely. The one, the one class that you could never guarantee, no matter how hard you worked, no matter how hard you studied, whether you got an A or a B, was art. Really, really hard. So, but there is an assumption out there that art is easier. I don't know why. I'm not going to go there. Um, anyway, so earthworks, starting of the wave field, 10,000 square feet, 100 by 100. You can sit in the wave and read a book. Followed by, I tend to work in series as an artist because formally, materially, my work ranges. At which point, the second in this series is not so much of a water wave, but what happens to the sand as a wave begins to get nearer to the beach, nearer to the shore. It's called flutter, very shallow wave formations. It's at a federal courthouse in Miami. <clears throat> and then the last of the series is an hour north of here. It's Storm King. Turned out to be a complete environmental reclamation of a brownfield gravel pit um, at the farthest edges of Storm King, where we ended up doing a displacement. We were able to use a berm that formally hid the unsightly gravel pit. And we built most of the artwork out of this berm. And each of the waves. Goes about 18 <laughs> feet high. And yeah, when you're working at this scale, they are not letting you drive the bulldozer. And <laughs> I'm a terrible driver, you wouldn't want to operate heavy machinery. But for me, with every series I do, I'm also teaching myself about scale. So, what if I could go from something where you could sit in and read a book and it was very intimate to something that is so big that the waves obscure your view wave to wave, but from the high side of the site, you can look down on the whole thing, but it's an absolute magical exploration coming from the lower part of the hill. So that's what Storm King looks like, or actually, if we get a little sleet and snow, it's going to look like this again. Um, and people say, well, I don't get it. It's a living work. How is it going to last over time? And I'm from Ohio, and there are these 1,500-year-old earth mounds from the Hope and Adena tribes, and they're still there. <laughs> there are farmers, and they have these like mounds in the middle of their 
farm field, and they're just there. There's one that's in the shape of a serpent, which was one of my favorites when I was growing up. So where do I go after that? Still love to work with Earth. Private collection in New Zealand called Fold in the Field, and that's literally what I did to start it. And then it grew and grew. Each fold is 60 <coughs> feet wide. So this is actually the largest sculpture I've ever made, this sculpture. It's at a private collection that happens to house the largest um, Richard Serra piece and the largest Anish Kapoor piece. So I got to kind of compete with the big boys. Um, and yes, those are sheep, and yes, they like to help mow the lawns. <laughs> but just to give you an idea, and it, it's a former degraded pasture land that we reclaimed, and it actually came from. So we get back into inside and outside, very large outdoor works, much smaller intimate studio sculptures. This is called Flow, FSC certified two by fours, made to create a wave, or I've done seven exhibitions, and this is part of something called systematic landscapes. What if I could bring a hill inside and you could walk on it? 3,000 square feet, again, sustainably harvested wood. Um, from the front approach, it looks like a cresting wave. From the back side, it looks like a mountain or a hill. So again, ambiguity. We're gonna get into this at the end. What is it about perhaps a dual identity that might make us feel a little bit in between states. Don't know, but I think it's what I bring to the table. Um, another piece that, again, I'm a very committed environmentalist. So this one took a mountain range near where we summer in Colorado, sectioned it and pulled it apart, and you could walk through it. It's called Blue Lake Pass. Or another piece which is focused on a <coughs> singular island in the middle of the, in the southern reaches of the Atlantic Ocean called Bouvet, called Waterline, and I basically created a drawing in space, which led to my first permanent water landscape, which is a San Francisco Bay. It's called Where the Land Meets the Sea, because I decided to explore both land and water. And so as you sit at the California Academy of Sciences on the Western Terrace, you get to eat lunch under the San Francisco Bay. So my art is always trying to get you to be aware of our natural surroundings. We're incredibly visual, and the minute we can't see it, and sometimes the minute we can't own it, we pollute it. So as an environmentalist, maybe I'm just quietly getting you to be much more aware of your surroundings, what's literally right below your feet. Or this one is again, the San Francisco Bay, but cast in 100% recycled silver. Or this I love, um, what does this remind you of? U.S. consulate in Beijing um, <laughs> took one look at it and said, my God, it looks like a dragon. And I can't look at the Yangtze River now without seeing the feet and the mouth of a breathing fire dragon. So these are rivers, and a lot of what I do focuses on water. And I think with climate change and aquifers being depleted and glacial melting, you're going to hear a lot more about water stress around the world. And I'm very much focused on raising attention. So I just completed a piece. It's at the Renwick in um, Washington, D.C. It's in their inaugural show. It's the nation's first museum, and I'm one of seven artists. And I took the Chesapeake Bay, because again, I think Washington's right about here and folded it. So that's my little sketch. This is how I sketch as an artist. And what does that mean? I took a historic building, a historic room, and what does water do? It just flows wherever it wants to go. Out of little marbles. that kind of just take over and go wherever the Chesapeake went. And the, wa the marble is a very special larger marble. It's not a professional, it's not a finished marble. It's something my dad brought home. He brought me home a box of these marbles because he was Dean of Fine Arts at OU and he invited all these glass blowers in. And when I was a kid, this is a 1960s artisanal glass blowers marble. It has a lot of imperfections and it's only used now because it's a low melt glass for fiberglass insulation. Oh, yeah. And I've been obsessing about this damn marble, sorry, <laughs> since I was a kid, and I could never find it. 
took one look at the space, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and the curator knew the source. And now I have boxes of these models. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy now. And that's another, um, again, I make the waxes and then cast and recycled silver. This is the Chesapeake Bay. And again, it looks like a ginger root to me. Or this is the Hudson River and Long Island Sound, and this negative point is Manhattan. So again, can I get us to think about things that you're not thinking of? And this is a figure ground, you know, reverse field. We tend to think of the land. We don't really see the water as a connected unified whole. And we also don't really think of it as a precious entity. We tend to know where we are along the river. Are we thinking about what's downstream? And maybe we're only thinking about what's upstream if someone's polluting. But again, so I'm trying to get us to see these as unified holes. Or this one, I took one look at this picture diagram in the New York Times, and it was the floodplain of Hurricane Sandy. If you look at New Jersey, how badly hit they were, and then you look at Manhattan and the Long Island Sound, and it became a Pin River installation. And it's up right now at Jack Shaman Gallery um, in a group show with Ellen at Suey's work, and with it are bodies of water, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, and I did the Red Sea as well, which oh, I forgot to put it in here. Um, but it, the Red Sea is like up a boat. So again, we tend to see what we see. We don't see what's below the surface. Or this one is circumferentially the latitude, the Arctic Circle, um, the latitude around Manhattan, and then at the equator. What if you were to pull away the water? These are the mountain ranges. Most of our mountains are underwater, of course. The tallest mountain in the world is Hawaii, not Everest. It beats Everest by about 200 feet. But you might not be thinking. So maybe I can get us to reframe our point of view and our perspective. Or this one I just completed for Brown. It's a water table of the um, Narragansett Bay and Rhode Island's up here. Providence is up there. Oh, and someone sent me this, so I kind of love that. Um, red tail hot, taking a drink. Um, not to confuse you guys, but the other side of me is building architecture. So this is a chapel for the Children's Defense Fund. <coughs> or Novartis's campus in Cambridge, Mass. We've been working on it since 2009. Uh, decided they had a West Campus which is a former candy factory, the Neko factory, with the very hardscape landscape. So I ended up master planning the East Campus, giving them a public park that anyone can use. So it's about a million square feet, and then this is about a 400,000 square foot research medical building, um, which is again inspired. This is the front entry. This is along Mass Ave. Everything along Mass Ave had to be given back to retail. So you had to literally define the entrance to Novartis, and yet you weren't allowed a front door on Mass Ave. So this whole thing hides up here a theater, an auditorium, but it also becomes the entrance portico to the building. This is inspired again by science, and I'll get to that in a minute. But it's a translation between something that is very much about nature and what does medicine do, it systematizes that patterning. So the whole Frick pattern is kind of a dialogue between what science does to nature to discover new medicines, and that's sort of a rendering about what it'll look like once the storefronts are in. So this was the last block connecting MIT heading towards Harvard. It was an empty, abandoned parking lot for years, and we've been able to create an urban infill project that will re-engage the street side. And this is just a hint of the inside part, which is all about getting the scientists to come out of their labs and meet one another. And it's all based on a microscopic view of human bone. And you can see right through it, and that's sort of that pattern. As well as I did this project for Shanto University in Guangdong Province, um, where the entranceway, and they wanted a bell tower, so this is a sculptural element that I created. And of course, that sculpture, it, well, it's about 90 feet high. It was stood like a category five typhoon. 
We installed it about two years ago, and it is a brush stroke. Mm. It's calligraphy, and the request was, could you make a bell tower? And when students first enter, they ring the bell, they hide their circuits, what their hopes and dreams are, and when they graduate, they ring the bell, and they again share their, what they're gonna do. So it's kind of a symbolic thing. And just to give you an idea, um, there will be five monuments, and they break the five chapters in the book. One deals with Native American issues, and the last of those projects is a bridge that commemorates what was the most sacred fishing site of the Pacific Northwest. It's called Celilo Falls. More water flowed over Celilo Falls than flows over Niagara Falls, and it was deliberately inundated by the last dam to go into the Columbia. So we will create a bridge that will teach a deep a geologic history of Celilo Falls, go into the Native American history, go into when the time when Lewis and Clark barely made it over the falls, and then the decision by Army Corps to create this last dam, it goes silent about two-thirds of the way, and at the very end, there's one quote that will tell you what it used to sound like here. And this is a six-part series of artworks along the Columbia River, of which there are incredible landscape rec reclamation sites. So we were met in state parks, city parks, with parking lots and restroom facilities, and no way of connecting back to nature. And then we were able to restore almost 3,000 acres, all told, of to dunes, natural grasses, and wetlands. So that's sort of what that, the westernmost site, Cape Disappointment, looks like today. And this is, again, what we were met with, parking lots. No way to get to the most sacred estuary, most abundant estuary, um, the Columbia River estuary. So they were about to build a whole other parking lot, and we got them to do a transit study, and instead, we proved they didn't need that parking lot and they donated it back and created a natural wetlands that takes the water and cleans it before it goes out into the bay and leaves you right there connected back to nature. So wherever I can in my design as well as in my art, I'm trying to get you to connect back to the natural world. Oh, and the other memorials, of course, are or monuments. They're all to me memory works. Is the Women's Table at Yale. Civil Rights Memorial, the Vietnam, and my last memorial called What is Missing, which is dedicated to the environment. And even though I say it's my last, I created my own not-for-profit foundation, and I'll be donating to it. So it's what if you could take a memorial and make it jump form? What if it could be like water? It could flow wherever <coughs> it was invited in. It's free as long as you share it. Um, we've created through the BBC, National Geographic, um, and Cornell over 75 one to two minute educational films. And there's an empty box room. You can borrow this show and you can literally hold the species in your hands and learn about what, why they're missing. So don't eat. Coming up, Atlantic bluefin tuna. In other words, after Japan and Spain, we're taking it out. This is a species we could save by just not eating it. Or we took over the Times Square Creative Time billboard. Um, I surface as Earth Day, because again, it's volunteer for me, so I tend to surface on Earth Day for it. And this one you guys are gonna kind of love. Um, this is like 100 tons of organic, toxin-free compost. <laughs> and Philip Lim had invited me as an artist to do the show. And I said, hmm, I'll do it, but I want to work with organic, toxin-free earth. All the earth was repurposed to community parks throughout the city of New York. I brought the Perfect Earth Foundation in, and they sent out an email blast through Philip Lim that tells you what do you do with 200 tons of toxin-free organic soil. You create Philip Lim's 10th year anniversary fashion show, you promote toxin-free organic and agricultural practices, and you repurpose the soil. So why is what is missing involved? Because over a third of the world's arable land has been lost to erosion. And regenerative agriculture 
which is no-till <coughs> organic, could potentially sequester over 40% of CO2 emissions. So what, what is missing tries to do is link habitat protection with species protection. We created a little film that's called Save Two Birds with One Tree, and it's all about linking the two and being able to take a huge bite out of climate change emissions at the same time protecting species. <coughs> so within it, you know, and all this went out through Philip Land, through Perfect Earth, through us, that teaches you what you can do to make your lawn toxin free. And of course, for me, it's not just the species that are at risk, it's the habitat. This is what we're faced with. And these are some things as an artist that I wanted to point out are missing that you might not be thinking of. So the question is, how can we protect it if we don't even realize it's gone? So this is the scale of species. Or the fact that a cod in the 1890s was bigger than a man. So history and memory, with every successive generation, we assume what we know is the baseline. But the baseline keeps shifting. And with every successive generation, we lose sight of what we've lost. These are buffalo heads. Skills. So go to the website, explore it, add a memory, something you've personally witnessed diminish. So we got a map, a growing map, an ecological history of the planet, and then actionable items, what you can do in your everyday lives, and what you can do um, sort of big picture macro thinking. You can view these stories <coughs> geolocated or along a timeline. And this is just a little hint of some of the stuff we'll be doing online for MOCA to teach a teaching timeline. So that's in the works as well. But this is what's up on the What is Missing website. The personal memories, we share one, historical quotes, core videos, conservation, our best success stories, our worst disasters, and these in-depth timelines of cities and waterways and species. So you can click on the timeline of London or New York. And the beauty is nature is resilient. And the minute we start protecting it, nature comes back. But you might not realize that according to this one Dutch explorer, the lobsters were six feet long, and the oysters were 12 inches in diameter. Or that sturgeon were so plentiful in the Hudson River that boats collided with them, and they were nicknamed Albany Beef, <laughs> and they were slaughtered and fed to the hogs. So there's a big part of green print which is going to be about envision a sustainable future. So what can an artist do that the experts aren't doing? And it's, it's giving us hope. And it's literally, if we took the entire world's population today and we lived at the density of Manhattan, how much space would seven billion people take up? State of Colorado. So maybe in art, we can get you to rethink what the problem is. So you have to give me a personal memory. And now we're home. So, MOCA. I love this space. Not the space, but the place. And the stories, and the stories that we can all bring to this place and share, whether it's in the museum or share online. But I think it's really important that we don't lose these memories. And we don't lose our shared stories and immigration. And whether it's a more general idea that every, other than Native Americans, we're all from somewhere else, and there's generalities that connect us to, to other immigrant stories, but also what makes us so special, and what makes each one of us, how can we share our stories? And I don't know, I think I was very in denial about being Chinese when I was a kid growing up, and little by little, I have kind of realized how much my entire work, and my entire body of work, is because of my dual identity. And I just want to end with, my mom and dad's tile is out there, because when you first come in and you enter MOCA, we didn't just come from our Chinatowns in San Fran and LA. We went all over the country, and it's a very complex immigration story, depending upon when you immigrated from China, as to where, where 
you know, where you ended up in the country. And so as you walk in, the journey wall almost in an instant tries to get people to reach, think of stereotype. We went everywhere. We're everywhere. We, we became a part of the fabric of this country. And what is that? So this is Athens, Ohio, and my father was a ceramicist. And this is one of his murals. It's like before we went to the moon, it's one of his moonscapes. And I think, you know, they never taught me about, you know, how you think, but I think there are certain things in our culture that we absorb through the skin, or maybe it's in the way he, all the dishes we ate out of were my dad's dishes, and the way my mother said, you know, you always have to think about other people, and everything you do, you need to share, and you need to teach, and you need to do something, probably because they were both educators, that gives back. But for whatever reason, I'm incredibly grateful for how they brought me up. And I just, just maybe, you know, I'm so committed to MOCA because I'm trying to, sh trying to connect back to something that is so important to them. And I think they were probably pretty pained when I was growing up that I was really only Chinese family. So I looked around and I wanted to fit in. But they didn't ever say anything. And little by little, I think my mom came here uh, my dad passed away in 89, but my mom came here a lot with me, and it was really important. Anyway, that's all I need to say. I think Nancy has some questions and whatever, but thanks for listening to me. Originally, I was going to try to moderate a conversation, but I think I feel the, the energy in the room that you might all have some questions for her. Um, that, was, that was wonderful. Even though I've known Maya in this capacity for over a year, she rarely shares um, many stories about um, her work or her life, and it's always about how are you doing, how are you doing, and I think that really is a testament now that I've heard how your parents raised you, that you have all that, uh, the influence they've had on you and how you live it out every day. Um, I, I think we open it up to some questions. I think we have time for maybe three questions. Um, and then she will, we do have, this is the plug. Um, <laughs> so there, we are, there is quite a bit of interest in the Journey Wall Child. Um, and again, with the Journey Wall Child, what we're trying to do is record your family history as well. So what we do, and Ted Chow actually sat through one of these series, um, but we, we sit down and we record your own history. So whomever you deem in your family, uh, we transcribe it and then give it to you as a family memento. Mm -hmm. And also put it in the MOCA collection, which is very important. So for instance, if your ancestor perhaps was a paper son, we would tag your oral history with certain keywords. This is important for many reasons. One is there's not enough academic research out there about the Chinese immigration story. So when we're able to tag it and collect these stories, then others who do research will be able to come to our collection, which is now 65,000 strong, um, and be able to do a little bit more research so they get the hints to where else they can go. Um, on top of that, again, coming and using MOCA as a reunion place, our reunion event next one, in addition to this one, is on October 12th, where we really have the museum is yours for the evening. Bring all your family members, come and celebrate, use it as an opportunity to gather. Uh, so as an incentive, Maya Lin has generously said, if you secure one today, um, she will sign it and, and also give you a copy of her topologies um, as a bit of incentive. Um, and we can, obviously, there are many ways to come around. Ted brought 24 of his cousins, um, and they came together and were able to secure a tile. Uh, my brother and I, again, are digging in for a tile, and then my 10 other cousins on one end are going to do that as well. I am very much um, just feel that this wall is really important. So, that, so let us open it up to some questions from Maya. Um, you're open to any questions? Yeah. Okay. Right. You, you mentioned your parents always let me choose what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, that's very atypical for sort of in, in some Chinese American families that there's a pressure to pursue more conventional, pragmatic pursuits. Um, my mom was a poet, and my dad was 
a ceramicist. Now, that wasn't his first profession. He was not allowed to go into art in China. His family like was like, no, nope. so he went into academic administration. And it took me years to figure out that why my dad went from being the ceramics professor at OU to being director of fine arts and then dean of fine arts. And he was like the toughest, meanest dean. He could balance the budget. And he got more money from the art department. They were so glad when he retired. But basically, it was because he was trained to be an academic administrator. He comes out, second career, you know, flees China before the communists have come in, goes to University of Washington, studies ceramics. Because it was something his parents had said, no, 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 you can't, you know, can't go into the arts. And so he was a bit of a rebel. And then my mother, poetry. And so I, I would say we're the anti-tiger mom family. <laughs> um, my dad I had so many calligraphy lessons and the proper upbringing. He promised if he had kids, they'd never have to do anything they didn't want to do. And that's how my brother and I were raised. And we were, I was impossible as a child. I was an I mean, I was difficult. And I'm sure they looked and were like, what have we done? But they really believed, they were, in a way, whether it's the scholar side of the Chinese ilk, or they were just rebels, but for some odd reason, we're like completely against stereotypes. And any of my friends who are Chinese are like, they didn't have that freedom growing up. It's a bit unusual. I don't know, does anyone else, their parents were, like maybe from the academics, I'm thinking maybe it's an academic thing that, you know, just let your kids do what they want to do. I don't, I don't know, I, but maybe I was just in a very unusual situation. Um, well, you, yeah, I, I think it's post-war, um, there was nothing to lose. You know, people figured that, well, you know, the McCarthy era and um, during that time, there was there could be an N bomb, and you know they they just figured we'll just we'll be artists, and like my, like my father was an artist, and you know abstract art was pretty radical at that time, and and being you know the only Chinese family in upstate New York, we, we just kind of just did what we wanted, and it yeah. was kind of maybe the best thing is to be isolated, right. and and you know speaking Chinese at home, and people didn't understand what we were saying, and the the food we ate was, you know like. Uh, you know, like, you know, just uh, tofu sandwiches, you know, and, you know, people would stare at us all the time, and they always said, when are you going back home? But we never, we couldn't go back. And then we my parents yeah. brought us up only speaking English. They only spoke Chinese to each other when they didn't want my brother and I. <laughs> <laughs> and they were always arguing because they had different pronunciations, because my mother spoke Amoy, Mandarin and Shanghai. It's, is there a Shanghai dialect? It's like yeah. Shanghaiese. And my dad spoke Mandarin and Fukinese. And we couldn't figure out why they were always arguing over pronunciation. But it was just one of those things that they, they wanted us to assimilate. And the generation right after us, bilingual, but definitely raised ABC, like you wouldn't believe. Additional questions yet? See, I knew it. I knew it, Stephen. Um, the Vietnam War mm -hmm. was very early in your, in your career. Uh, yeah, I was eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you were saying that uh, personally you didn't want to be bound by being an artist, an architect, or say a memorial maker. Uh, but professionally, how were you able to, to position yourself? I mean, I think very few artists, like maybe Ido Kanchi, have been able to try to bridge architecture and art. Um. I think the hardest one was, it's, it, I got labeled as an architect right off. I think it was harder once you get labeled. It maybe took a decade longer to really have people come up. And like one of the first artworks I ever did was for the Wexner Center. And I would just sit there and someone would say, I really like, and I'll remember it when someone said, I really like Groundswell. And I was like, but it took probably a decade longer of building a body of artwork to, to really get people, because I think we live in a world of specialization. Let's face it, modernity and industrialization 
led us to silos and specialization. The, the notion of interdisciplinary is probably something that comes along, you begin to see it much more now. Um, it's emerging in the 90s, it's emerging in the O's. But it took a while, and I think um, it's not like I had a choice. So literally, I just keep doing what I'm doing and knowing that I don't take on much architecture. So the funny thing is, there's a lot more art than there is architecture, but I was labeled and thought of as an architect, but I have to be really, really careful how many commissions, like Novartis was at 2009, I took it on. I wasn't allowed to even say who I was working for for the first two years. No one can see the inside of the building um, because that's just the way the company is. And, and But I just loved working on it because in the end it was the goal was to make an environment where scientists would begin to engage with one another outside of their labs. And it, it almost creates a campus-like feeling inside as well as out, which I really thought was fantastic. I think I'm very much a prescriber of the, the human qualities, the psychological nature of space. And um, that's just something I'm drawn to. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> I think you did. Um, one final question, and then we'll have um, the Myelin's book is available for purchasing, and I believe you will send right will send them. Um, I will send them. And they're uh, uh, available at uh, $75. Uh, and uh, we encourage you members, I think, get 10% off. Mm -hmm. So you can become a member, especially if you have your ID and IC. Um, but uh, yeah, I shall do that. But one final question. And then for those of you who are interested in securing a journey wall title, does it, you know, you can put a pledge down for if you want to do it. Um, we have eight tiles available for the rest of the year, and it'll close in April, and the event for the reunion is on October 12th, where we'll install each of the tiles. And before we break, though, we will show you the process. Each one of these tiles is really a piece of art, um, and we'll show you exactly how they're made, and my own lineup obviously designed the wall in each tile. But let me take one final question. Yes, sir. You kind of mentioned this at the uh, part of your presentation on your website, but how do you review the role of technology in you know, spreading you know, environmentalism and also perhaps have interest with, with your art and with your architecture? I, I think it's huge. And I think for me it intersects with um, the memorials. Because of what I love about them, the capacity of the internet is it's a new dimension. And it's a new dimension because it, it encompasses time. So I don't really think of it as trying to represent three-dimensional space. It's because you can overlay a temporal aspect and you can begin to relay information through time in a way, I actually think it's its own dimension, it's its own site, and that we're only beginning to tap into that. Because whenever a new technology comes along, it's always what we recognize. It tastes like this and it looks like that. So is it trying to be a magazine? Is it trying to be this? And I think it's beginning to really grow into that own space. And that own space is going to be both video clips as well as flat land. So it's two-dimensional and three-dimensional, well, fourth-dimensional space, which is the time aspect coming in. And I always think it's a little primitive when they, when they get tripped up on the three-dimensional space, trying to make it look like because it's its own beautiful space that comes to life. It's sort of like a, if you look at a children's picture book, but uh, animated, so you could literally be looking at a book, and then all of a sudden butterflies fly out of the page. Who couldn't resist that? So we're playing with that, both for missing, and we're really excited because I think what will happen with, say, the journey wall and with digital mocha is stories will come to life, and I think that's so much, and also I think Yes, it's great, the physical museum. We come here, we look at shows, but we also, we are connected to our to other regional museums, and the idea that we could create a hub and connect to one another. I mean, I think it would have been great as a kid to have been able, because we were the only Chinese family in Athens, Ohio, and I didn't realize, and I didn't get to share my fact that maybe I didn't quite fit in until I got to Berkeley when I was, guest teaching there, and I met 
Chinese people who grew up in the Midwest and were kind of isolated. And we have really similar experiences, and it's really nice to share those stories. And I think that's something where, whether it's a journey wall that comes to life, your journey comes to life, or an exhibit is, is really engaged, and we get to participate and add our stories, I just feel like the potential is really there, especially for a living history museum to kind of come to life through its connection to its internet work.